something that's that's interesting. Less than 50% have given a like of this interview, but everyone is learning. So yeah, it's a simple click and subscribe, guys. Like my channel, subscribe here. I want you to go see Darren's channel too and subscribe to his channel because we're going to have a wealth of information going back and forth. It's going to help everybody. And you're going to get on. You've got a ticket to get on right now. So that's what I got to give you a little bit of a plug there. So I appreciate it. Yeah, the cam. Let me let me talk a little bit about the cam lobes. Why yeah. we went to the bigger and bigger cores also, and that's because of a lobe loft curve. The NASCAR guys were using lobe loft for five years before we even really picked it up because before then we were really just brutalizing the valve train, just throwing everything we had at it. Okay. And where we really got in our head that something was going on that we had no concept of was when they came out with the titanium valve springs and the valve spring bill that year went from like 30 grand to $68,000 just for valve springs because wow. titanium valve springs were only good for one run. Oh my God. And because if they, they would, you could run them two or three, but if they broke the titanium shards went through the engine and the valve dropped, it was massive destruction. Yeah. So you just didn't take a chance. And those valves killed the top end power and over rev by like 15, 20 horse. They controlled the valve train too well. So what we want to do is we want that lobe to come up. Yep. And at 8,000 RPM, you're going to initiate a loft curve. In other words, it's going to launch. <laughs> right. And you want to design the asymmetrics of the back of the lobe to mm -hmm. catch that sucker on the way down. So, and you're only going to have a loft curve from 8,000 to about 10,000. There's not enough kinetic energy in the system to instill a loft curve under 8,000. So don't even try it. So what we did was, is we saw that. So then the bigger core cams allow you to control the acceleration and deceleration rate and the asymmetrics of the lobe. So you can accent that loft curve. So at 8,000, that cam would jump up with five to six more degrees of timing and another 20 thousandths of lift. And by the time you get to 10, 11,000, you've got 40, 50, 60 thousandths of lift and 14 degrees more duration. So it's a, it's a variable camshaft throughout the RPM range. Right. What happens is every valve spring, every everything has to be weighed and balanced and set. And those valve springs have to be matched because you have one cylinders have a different loft curve than the other. That's not going to work very well. So, and you have to change them out. The rate of that spring and the pressure of that spring. And a lot of times they don't change them out just because they're down. They change them out because that rate's changed and it changes the loft curve of the engine. Well, what happens if you put too weak of a valve spring or too heavy of a valve and you initiate that loft curve and it jumps up too fast at 8,000? And let's say it gains 12 degrees of duration at 8,000. Two things are going to happen. You're going to murder the torque. And the engine's going to nose over up top because you only have that range to work in. So if you initiate it hard, you're going to leave early. And then the, the valve train is going to go completely chaotic at high engine speed. So the other thing, why does it kill torque? Well, what happens when you put too much duration in an engine? It kills torque. So if you gain too much duration on a loft curve, it's going to kill the torque just like you put too big a duration of cam in it. Does it actually, does the lofting, does it actually change the position of the lifter wheel on the ramp with RPM? Relative to R, change it how? In location of the ramp. If it's lofting, it's going to land on a different part of the ramp. Oh, yes. In yeah. theory, you understand what yeah. I'm saying? There's, there's, an there's an asymmetric ramp on the back of the lobe. And, right. You know, at the torque peak, it's catching here. Yes. You know, and the base circle's down here. So right. It, as the RPMs increase, it starts catching later and exactly. later. And pretty soon, you're going to be landing on the base circle. Yep. Okay. Here's here's a quick. Let's see what this is. I don't know if this is quick. Oh yeah. Matter of fact, I was just talking about this today. Um, I had a manifold come in, two four manifold, and they'd put a a triangle in the bottom of the floor. And if you'll notice, all modern single plane manifolds, and just about anything you see, you'll have a runner. It just comes out and goes right into the other run. And all normally aspirated and limited engines have the runners, and they go right out directly over, and you just have a radius on the floor, flat floor. K 
Can it be recessed? Yeah, it can be recessed. It's not going to be detrimental other than the fact that the fuel fallout and again, you have G-forces, so the fuel is going to move back out of the venturi. It's going to hit the ground. It's going to hit the floor. It's going to disperse. Um, so what happens is if you have a recessed floor where the runners come out and then go down into a trough, the back runners will get real rich. They'll get a fuel hit on the racetrack because all the fuel is going all the way to the back. Yeah, we used to make V's in there in front of every port. We put a V in the floor to, to force that fuel back up into the runners. But a flat floor almost eliminates that issue. You don't have to worry about it. But what happens is if instead of a flat floor, you start making that higher and higher and higher. <clears throat> runners on a sheet metal manifold have to crosstalk. In other words, they have to exchange pressure waves back yeah. and forth. So. When this pressure wave is coming out, this one's going in. So that's a harmonic. It's harmonizing. Okay. If you put something in the way, it messes all that up. And what happens is you'll see dips in the fuel curve. I mean, it'll you'll have 500 pounds an hour, and all of a sudden it'll drop 20 and come right back again. Or it'll nose over soon, or it'll lean a cylinder out where you didn't see it before. So when you're designing a manifold, flat floor, don't, don't, Put it in. As a matter of fact, the worst thing I ever tried was I had a flat floor and I put a blade from one end of the manifold yeah. to the other. Oh, that that's the biggest disaster I ever tried in a sheet metal manifold. I'm surprised I didn't burn the motor up. <clears throat> hmm. Airflow is proportional to power. You can only have a 1500 to 2000 RPM power band and you can only operate... And that's when people ask me or tell me I need this much power. So I'm thinking, okay, we well have 400 cubic inches and you want 800 horsepower. That means you're going to have to wind it 8,800. You say, well, no, I want to do it on pump gas. Well, you ain't going to do that. <laughs> you have 2,000 RPM. Where do you want it? Right. Put it from 1,500 to whatever. I can put it from 10,000 on up. Wherever you want that 2,000. But that's all you have to work with when an NA engine is 2,000 RPM. So that's a, that's one fallacy. People think that in, in in the old the joke about the guy coming in saying I want 2,000 horsepower on pump gas and I want it to idle all day. Yeah, engines are good for 2,000 RPM. That's it. Where do you want it? Now I will say that a road race engine is tuned to what they call a triple harmonic. In other words, when it drops back down on the on, out of the corner, yep. it's in a harmonic, a positive harmonic. So it's feeding the cylinder. But as it revs up, it goes into a negative and then back into another positive. And it can actually have three. It comes out and goes in again because they have to go 4,500, 5,000 RPM wide on those short tracks sometimes coming out of a corner. So you have that's a completely different induction system trying to tune one of those. The higher speeds are a lot higher, a lot less taper. Yeah, there's a lot of things you have to do for a road race deal. You'd never even dream of doing for an engine. But as far as myths, myths, whatever myth. There's so many. I think I forgot them all. And test the video. Come on. Hello. It's Tim Hall. Wait, wait. Get in here. Come on, Elena. Get in here. Hey, guys. It's Tim Hall said here. It's episode 46. 46. Building up the old 409 Cleveland. Here we go. What we're going to do tonight is time the engine. Degree the cam in. We're going to talk about cam timing. That's the brains of the motor, right? Tells the motor what to do. Opens the valve this so long. Lets the air and fuel. Is this, is this? There you go. So that was a good time. It's not going to happen like that. It's the star I know. Squad. See, that's what we're like doing. I it. 